Good morning and welcome to Miller Johnson's COVID-19 response team presentation for this morning. This is Lori Murphy. I am the chair of our pri private client group. I'm here with Raj Melvia, who is the past chair of our business section and also my partner in the private client group. We're here to talk about estate planning action items. What can you do now? One of the questions that had been brought up when we sent out the alert to this is, what is the connection between COVID-19 and estate planning? Next slide. So where do we begin? COVID-19 has taken away our sense of control. We have news stories that are full of what-if scenarios. We have people who, even young people, who are worried much more about the possibility of becoming incapacitated for some period of time, about the possibility of being stranded somewhere where they can't take care of things for themselves, about people who have had to be separated from their children or their family members due to quarantine, and also, unfortunately, the possibility uh, that you might actually pass away without having your affairs in order. So it's very easy to become overwhelmed as we are trying to deal with these. And our goal with the state planning is really to give you a much greater sense of control and to assure that your wishes are taken care of. Next slide. What we recommend that you do to start is just take a deep breath. These are very overwhelming times. And as I said, the idea of doing some estate planning or taking a look at your estate plan during these times is to allow you to take a better sense of control over your life and over the well being of your family. The good news is that there are many estate planning tasks that can be done while you're stuck at home. Now, we recognize that for many people, staying at home does not mean binge watching Netflix. For many of us, it means working very long hours and not having much time to address other personal issues. But if you do have that time, now is the time to try to deal with some of those things that you've been putting off for a long time. As with every other matter in this crisis, we ask you to be kind to yourself, be patient with yourself, be kind to others, be patient with others. We are trying hard to address this together and our Miller Johnson team is happy to help you. What we plan to review this morning, if you go to the next slide, is what can you do now? What can you do while you are stuck at home or if you're an essential worker, what can you do in between times that gives you some sense of control. The first thing you can do is review your existing estate plan if you have one. Even if you don't have an estate plan in existence, you can check your beneficiary designations and asset titling to figure out how things are owned and with your beneficiary designations to make sure that your life insurance, retirement plans, and those kinds of assets will pass according to your wishes at your death. Also things you can do now, you can locate your important documents and figure out who your professional support team is and get that written down somewhere so your family can locate it. Even while you're at home, you can designate a medical decision maker who could make decisions for you if you couldn't do it for yourself. You could create or update a financial power of attorney. Even in the privacy of your own home, you can provide for guardianship for minor children. Most importantly, you can use this as an opportunity to communicate with your family about your estate plan and your wishes. I'm going to turn it over to Raj Melvia for the next few slides. Raj? Thanks, Lori. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And, you know, I, I just have to apologize in advance, you know, with the, the social distancing. I know it's been you know, interesting and, and difficult for some of us. It's been really difficult on my my dog. I'm here at home. And so if you hear a howling in the background, you know, I, I apologize in advance. Um, we we are really, I think, in a in a place where uh, families are 
are, are feeling mixed emotions. You know, they they might be nervous, they might be scared, they might uh, have extra time on their hands and feel like they need activities to do. As Lori mentioned, still focused on work, some may be off of work. I think everybody is in a different spot, and um, we, we look at our healthcare, uh, the healthcare families we work with, the professionals, those who are on the front lines. You know, they are experiencing the pandemic every day through their profession, and and they are having some of these similar feelings. And so, what we're trying to do, as Lori mentioned, is give you a really a, an outline, a, a Cliff Notes version of what you can be doing while you are in this period of quarantine or while you, while you are experiencing some of these feelings of what can you do uh, for yourself and your family. And a lot of the things that Lori has mentioned, um, you know, don't really need y- your attorney or advisor to help you with. Some of these you can you can do on your own. And some of these checklists we're providing you with are, are meant to be a resource for you to go down the list and, and check the box to see if this is something you have done, need to follow up on. And so one of the previous slides, Lori really gave a good roadmap on what you can do now to you know, really get your, your house in order while uh, we're in this period of, of quarantine and social distancing. And so one of the first bullets on that list was review your estate plan. And I will say that, you know, as a, as an estate planner myself, I think Lori would agree, having kind of a, a type A personality, we want to feel like we're in control. We want to know that this is off our worry list. And so that's what estate planning is. It's it's unlike a kitchen remodel where you can enjoy, can enjoy the benefits right away. I mean, part of this, it's not a tangible benefit. It's something to give you peace of mind. It's a legal structure or construct to make sure that things will happen as you wish <clears throat> not only at your passing or incapacity or uh, a situation that we mentioned before, but even while you're healthy and you're living. And we're going to talk about some some types of documents that will, will govern um, situations where you, where you are available and still in control. <clears throat> um, I would say a couple of these things here on, on this slide, again, you, you can do on your own when you have some time, if you have an estate plan, find it. Where is it? Is it in the safe? Is it in <clears throat> in a cabinet somewhere? Is it on top of the fridge after you met with your estate planning lawyer years ago and you still haven't had a chance to put it in a safe place? Um, and one of the things I do when I talk to a, a client uh, for either uh, a review meeting or if it's been if it's been quite some time since we've we've talked about the estate plan is pull out pull out a, maybe a summary that was done or a, a a chart that lists who all the fiduciaries are in the plan. Uh, who are my VIPs, my trustee, my executor, my healthcare directive, my guardian, if you have minor children, and, and just do a check, <clears throat> a health check really. Is, is this lineup still what I need? And if not, is it time to make some changes? Um, you know, and, and I think while we mentioned that some of this can be done on your own, you know, of course we're going to recommend that if if you do need to make updates, and they they are ones that can't be done on your own, uh, maybe due to a resignation or an acceptance of some sort of position in the estate plan, that you know you do get your your personal estate plan counsel involved because that's that's what the estate plan attorney's job is to do is to assess. Uh, make recommendations and then help help you implement what your plan should look like. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so on one of the the checklists that Lori mentioned initially, one of these one of the items was check beneficiary designations. This is this is a very I think often missed uh, follow up item on an estate plan. You know, typically when an estate plan is prepared it's done in two phases. The first phase is an analysis of the family situation and a preparation of uh, legal documents to implement those wishes and the signing or execute those documents. There really is a second phase and that phase is 
coordinating your assets with your estate plan documents. So if you have a basic will or you, you have uh, a joint trust or a separate trust, which are pretty commonplace these days in estate plan structures, there needs to be coordination with those documents. And not all assets belong in a, in a trust. Um, there might be recommendations to have family members be beneficiaries on certain types of assets, such as a retirement plan. Uh, there might be recommendations to have one of the estate plan structures or constructs named as a beneficiary. And so these, these are recommended at the time the estate planning is completed, but uh, it's not uncommon for the follow through to not happen. And so it's a good time to check your beneficiary designations. Look at the key types of assets that have beneficiaries, life insurance, your qualified plans, which are retirement plan accounts, mainly 401ks, 403bs, your <clears throat> IRAs, your uh, other types of executive comp plans you might have or um, if you're self-employed or if you have a small business, you might have um, a SAP or, you know, certain types of um, funds where you can set aside uh, pre-tax dollars into a, a retirement plan account. These are all types of assets where you complete a form, uh, either with your company or with a custodian. There might be a third-party service administrator involved where you're going to name beneficiaries. And it, it's, it's interesting because for the most part, your beneficiary designation will control. And even if you have commands in your estate plan on how to deal with certain uh, retirement plan account assets or life insurance, your beneficiary designation under state law is, is generally going to control and, and override that. So it's important to coordinate it. There are exceptions. And, you know, for example, if you have a retirement plan account that is governed under a federal law called ERISA, and a, an example of that would be a 401k, um, there, are, there are certain requirements on who you have to name as beneficiaries. And if you don't follow those requirements, then a, a waiver might be needed with the plan custodian under federal law. And so it's important to make sure that your retirement plan accounts under ERISA are also what you want them to be. And if they're doing something that ERISA doesn't like, that you have the appropriate waivers. Um, we, we're not going to spend time on this because we want to keep moving along with our presentation. But some of you may have heard about a, <clears throat> a federal law that was passed at the tail end of last year that went into effect in the beginning of this year, and that is known as the SECURE Act. And the SECURE Act dealt primarily with retirement plan accounts. It was legislation put together at the last minute. It was put together quickly, and we know that legislation that is put together quickly um, will have some gaps, some gray areas that need guidance. The SECURE Act is definitely one of those. And what the SECURE Act did was it dramatically changed how beneficiaries can receive distributions from retirement plan accounts. And the, the common types of beneficiaries we see in retirement plan accounts are spouses and children. And so the rules dramatically changed how children, or I should say non-spouses, can receive retirement plan benefits. And so that's something to keep an eye on. Get educated on the SECURE Act because that can impact, uh, in some cases, dramatically how your retirement plan accounts will operate and whether they have um, changed how your estate plan was set up in light of these beneficiary designations. Next slide, please. It's good to just do a checkup on your asset titles. We've listed a series of assets here that are common with families. Real estate is transferred by deed. You'll want to check the last deed of record for your residence or if you have additional properties 
your financial accounts, which consists of bank accounts, checking savings, money market, any investment accounts or brokerage accounts. If you have the old school stock certificates in your uh, safe or in a uh, safe place, you'll want to check the title on those, any closely held business interests. And what you're doing when you're checking ownership is, is the ownership in your name is in the name of uh, a trust that you may have set up as part of your estate plan. Um, do any of these assets have beneficiaries listed on them? Most financial accounts these days can have what's called a pay on death or a transfer on death beneficiary designation that's done with the custodian of the account. And so, again, it's just another uh, way to simplify the passing of assets uh, by operation of law and, and checking to see if you have any beneficiaries on those accounts and they're what you intend is, is an important thing to do. And joint assets, a common example of joint assets would be uh, a joint bank account or title to real estate owned, for example, by uh, a married couple. And the general rule is that if it's properly titled jointly with rights of survivorship, that asset's going to pass to the surviving owner. And so, again, a good time to make sure that when, you know, to have your affairs in order, you want property not only to have um, the titling that you want, but if it's intended to pass to a, a surviving spouse or a surviving joint owner, you want to make sure that the titling is, is appropriate. I just finished a case where the, the family thought they had a certain bank account titled jointly, and they found out after, uh, sadly, after the first spouse passed that the account actually was titled as what's called tenants in common. And then we've listed that on our slide here. Tenants in common is a different form of ownership. It's not joint with rights of survivorship. It, it essentially slices the account in half so that each owner owns his or her own piece of the account. And so unfortunately we had to deal with a, a probate for one half of the account. So just an example where you know, checking the ownership of the account uh, would have would have prevented that. Um, next slide, please. Hopefully, you can see that the top of the slide. Some of it's it's cut off on my end, but the the, the title of the slide is locate important documents and information. We covered this a little bit earlier, but just a few items on this slide I want to mention. You know, we're in a new day and age of, of, you know, technology and digital assets and everything is seems to be controlled by a password, whether it's, you know, a bank account or access to credit card statements, um, trying to pay certain bills. And, you know, as Lori mentioned earlier, for those of you who are, you know, binge Netflix watching, um, you know, every type of service has some sort of password to log in. I think that last bullet point on the slide is important. Document your digital life. Um, it's something that I, I feel like I um, <clears throat> am trying to keep up on on a, a weekly or monthly basis. Just have a spreadsheet or take some notes if you still uh, write by hand, You know, type something up that just lists all of your accounts um, from financial to social media to miles to you know, email passwords and so forth and usernames so that if something does happen, you know, as Lori mentioned, you, it, it might even be a situation where you're just not available. You're, uh, you're stuck somewhere or, you know, a family member who's stuck somewhere and you need asset, you need, <clears throat> excuse me, access to information. Um, there, there's a place where you can get all of this without, you know, having to cause additional stress and trying to, to locate, locate the information or, um, you know, send communications when you're trying to, to maybe limit those. Next slide, please. Um, th this is just one more slide I'll cover and then I'll uh, pass it back to, to my partner, Lori. This is, again, this is another one of those, I think, softer issues, but it is often um, overlooked. And it's it's definitely something that we can all be doing now while we're you know, in in quarantine and have 
a, a, hopefully a little bit of extra time on our hands. Uh, again, creating creating lists and and this time the important information is really who are the the VIPs in your um, professional advisor and you know professional uh, type of community. So so this would be a list of not only uh, family emergency contacts but important. Uh, professionals at your place of employment. Um, if you own a business, you know the the, the key owners, the key uh, the key folks who have knowledge of the business and would would be able to answer questions if something were to happen. Um, your healthcare providers, your primary physician, any specialists, your tax preparer or CPA, um, insurance professionals, financial professionals. Um, your attorney, in some cases, you might have multiple attorneys for different specialties. And so just having this list available, having it accessible uh, where family members know how to reach it is a good idea. I had a, uh, a family come in uh, before this all happened, but it's one of my last in-person meetings uh, before the quarantine where, you know, we were doing a review of, a, of the estate plan and um, what they had done is they had kind of taken a picture of every uh, of their list and they shrunk it down and put it in a uh, laminated uh, business card size um, little sheet that went into their wallet and billfold. I thought that was uh, a good idea, something I hadn't seen before. So there are a lot of different ways to organize your information, but you know, do what's best for you. Just make sure you have the right contacts down so that if something were to happen, you've got you know, a list that, that family members and loved ones can go to. Lori, um, I'm going to pass it over to you to uh, start talking about some of the medical uh, decision-making that, that families can look at right now. Thanks, Raj. Let's jump into the medical decision-making. So one of the things that we've been forced to think about is what happens if we can't make our own medical decisions? So we're all familiar with the idea of informal family decision-making, typically by spouses and adult children, but legally speaking, those people do not have a legal right to make your medical decisions for you. And medical providers oftentimes will rely on that kind of informal family decision-making, but the better way of handling things is to plan ahead. So you may have a patient advocate designation and that can be confusing because a patient advocate designation may also be called a medical power of attorney, an advanced directive, or a living will. Um, but really, that's the living will is a little bit different. You might also have a do not resuscitate order, or you could have a court-ordered guardianship for a person who can't make their own medical decisions. Next slide. A patient advocate designation, again, also called a medical power of attorney or an advanced directive, may include a living will. A living will is really that very end of life, whether I would be resuscitated in the event my heart stopped and my breathing stopped. A patient advocate designation allows you to appoint a trusted decision maker, and you can include instructions for a wide variety of medical treatment decisions including end-of-life decisions. Now, end-of-life decisions can only be made by your patient advocate if your document specifically authorizes that and if the decision to terminate treatment is medically sound. You can also have your patient advocate designation include mental health treatment authorization. So you could have someone act on your behalf to make mental health decisions for you, but that's got to be specifically authorized in the document. Next slide. A patient advocate designation in Michigan has to be a written document. It has to be signed and dated and have two witnesses. And here's the hard part with the situation that we're in now is the witnesses can't be your family and can't be your medical providers. So. The only people we're seeing these days are our family and our medical providers. The good news is that the executive order that just passed yesterday or the day before now allows remote witness and notary under most circumstances. So if you don't have the ability to have someone outside your family act as a witness, we have some alternatives for you on that and we'll be issuing an alert on that later today. 
The patient advocate designation applies anytime you can't make your own decisions. As long as you can make your own decisions, then you are in the driver's seat. But if you can't make your decisions, even if it's just temporary, your patient advocate is the one who can step in and make those decisions for you. So it isn't only end of life decisions. And really most of the time, it is the much broader range of medical decisions. That might include which medications you might take, for example, whether you might take this, um, the, the new proposed treatment for the COVID-19 virus. There's not been clear evidence of whether it does or doesn't work, but somebody's going to have to authorize that, balance the risks and benefits on your behalf if you're not able to make those decisions for yourself. Next slide. When we think about medical decision making, like I said, living wills, Michigan doesn't allow a standalone living will, but that's no problem because the instructions about end of life decision making can be included in your patient advocate designation. And I actually think Michigan made a good choice on this because none of us really knows which decisions we're going to be confronted with. So who would have known two months ago that we'd even be thinking about this terrible virus. And so with the patient advocate designation, you can tell your patient advocate in your document or even verbally, I would want my life support to be continued under this or that circumstance, but I'd want it to be discontinued under these other circumstances. You want your person to be able to make decisions consistent with your wishes, consistent with your process. A do not resuscitate order, if you're in the hospital, you may yourself tell your medical providers that you would not want to be resuscitated. If you're out of the hospital, for example, in a nursing home, adult foster care setting, if you've got home health care providers, if you don't want to be resuscitated in that out of hospital situation, you want an ambulance person not to have to resuscitate you, you can sign a Michigan do not resuscitate order. So that's different than your patient advocate designation, but might be appropriate in many situations. If you haven't taken care of these things and decisions need to be made, you may have to have a court ordered guardianship. And that can come into play if there's no decision maker appointed, if there's no appropriate informal decision makers, if there's a disagreement among your informal decision makers, or if it's decisions beyond just emergency care. For example, I've now recovered from an urgent situation, but now decisions need to be made about my long-term placement. Next slide. So what can you do now while you're stuck at home or while you're scrambling around as an essential worker? If you have a patient advocate designation document, a medical power of attorney and advanced directive, as Raj mentioned, find it. Take a look at it. See if it still does what you want it to do. Are you still comfortable with the decision maker you have appointed? Maybe you did it 10 years ago and maybe now your children are grown and they are the more appropriate decision makers. Do you want to add any specific instructions? Those might include instructions about mental health care. Those might include instructions specific to a disease that you have acquired since you signed your document. You might even want to include specific instructions about the decision-making process. For example, I want a second opinion from a university medical center. I want the opportunity to participate in clinical trials. I want you to discuss this with my pastor, with my rabbi, with my priest. I want you to discuss this with other family members. So you can include those kinds of specific instructions. With this crisis where you are in a situation that if you go to the hospital, you might not have a family member with you, we're recommending that you scan it to your phone so that you have it in the event of an emergency. If you've done your document with Miller Johnson, oftentimes we can send it to you electronically. But again, even if you're at home, you can use an app like Genius Scan to just have a copy of it on your phone. And that goes to what Raj had mentioned earlier. We do recommend that you take a picture or scan of your uh, medical insurance card and your driver's license because again, if you end up having to go to the emergency room and don't have everything that you need with you, it can be handy to have that information 
with you with your phone. If you want to make changes to your document, contact your estate planning attorney, or we've got some additional resources on the next page. The key thing really is to talk to your loved ones about your wishes. So I've listed in the materials what I think is an excellent resource that the American Bar Association has put together. It's called the Consumer Toolkit for Healthcare Advanced Planning. What I like about it is that it helps you think about and talk about that process of decision making. So many of us say the same thing about end of life care. If there's no chance of quality of life, then I don't want extraordinary treatment. Well, what do you mean by no chance? What do you mean by quality of life? What do you mean by extraordinary treatment? This is a tool that can help you think through these things with your family members. Next slide. There are some great free resources out there. So if you don't have a patient advocate designation, sign one. There are good forms available online. You can contact your attorney about the temporary remote witness and notary executive order. And I've listed three possible alternatives of spots where you can pull up and print and sign a patient advocate designation. You certainly can talk with your lawyer if you have specific thoughts. These are intended to be much more generic, but it's important, if nothing else, to designate somebody as a decision maker. One of the issues that uh, somebody had sent us a question about ahead of this seminar was, I'm just a renter. Do I really need an estate plan? Well, you might not need a full-scale estate plan, but you certainly need a patient advocate designation. Every adult member of your household should have a patient advocate designation so that somebody can make medical decisions for you if you can't do it for yourself. I'm going to send this back to Raj to talk about some other things that you can do to protect your family and to protect young children if you're unavailable or unable to take care of things for yourself. Raj? Thanks, Lori. And it, just if I may, um, Jeff, can you go back just a couple slides? Just to, uh, go back to something Lori was mentioning on patient advocate. You know, just just a quick takeaway. I think many of us in, in our, our practice group are seeing healthcare professionals right now to help them get their affairs in order. I think they're they're <clears throat> overwhelmed. They um, are, are nervous. You know, they're they're around uh, patients and exposed to to the virus more, and so naturally the the, the planning is on their mind. One question that I that has come up quite frequently has been about intubation and I'm, I'm it's not to be confused with the term incubation it's intubation which is really a, a procedure involved involving an endotracheal tube that um you know is is to allow patients to help uh breathe and because this is this virus is a respiratory a nasty respiratory disease i mean this is something that you know we're seeing in cases that that is uh potentially needed depending on how severe it is and so I think an important point to follow up on is when you review your patient advocate, look at exactly what Lori mentioned. I mean, how specific is it? Um, you know, is it or is it, you know, really the more important question, is it broad enough to cover, you know, different types of procedures that, you know, could could be needed in uh, the unfortunate uh, scenario where, you know, you or a loved one has been, you know, impacted by this virus. And um, I think, you know, we're seeing uh, the desire for patient advocate designations to be brought to allow the agent to make these types of decisions, to have flexibility, to have discussions with the healthcare workers, um, the nurses, the physicians, the medical offices, and even doing so remotely, maybe through telemedicine um, on video conferencing calls, because th that really um, could it could come down to something like that. So just, just an important takeaway is when you're reviewing those, you know, take a look at the, the provisions to really see how broad they are and if, if they are um, what you would like them to be. <clears throat> um, one more point is Lori mentioned having patient advocate designations for, you know, yourself and members of your family. I think an often overlooked uh, item is, is having 
you know, your children who, who have just become adults. So 18 year olds, 19 year olds, those in college who, who don't really have any assets, but they, um, they, they are legal adults. They could uh, have a health care issue and will need an agent to make a decision on their behalf. And I think a patient advocate is a, definitely a, a must type of legal document that, that an 18 year old should have along with the power of attorney. Thanks, Jeff. If you can go to the next few slides, I'm just going to briefly cover guardianship for minor children. And the, the takeaway here is not so much a discussion about um, formal legal guardianship in the probate court. And for those of you who are not familiar with legal guardianship, when a minor, uh, when a minor has no uh, parent, uh, then a court process is involved to appoint a legal guardian to essentially govern the minor's affairs, living situations, healthcare situations, really just stepping into the parental role with the exception of financial issues which are dealt with by a cons what's called a conservator. And we're, we're not going to discuss the, the formal guardianship process or the court proceeding, but you know, keeping with the theme on what can you do now while you're reviewing your plan, while you're at home, while you might be confronted with a situation uh, like Lori mentioned, potential quarantine, you're away from uh, your children, you have to travel uh, all of a sudden, and you're, you want to make sure that uh, your children have uh, a, a figure who can make legal decisions for them. That's where this delegation of parental powers can come into play. And th this is, this document, it, it is a document, but it's based on Michigan statute. And there are the statute's actually been around for quite some time, and you can Google it on your own. It's MCL 700.5103, MCL 700.5103, and I believe the statute even has, a, I think, a statutory type of a form built into the statute. But what this, what this law says is for a period of not to exceed six months, um, a parent can designate another adult with full parental authority. So parental authority examples, including, um, you know, decisions related to the child's care, custody, medical treatment, educational types of decisions, um, medications, um, schooling, daycare, extracurricular activities. These are all things that can be delegated to another adult under this, this rule. And it can't exceed six months, so it expires. It's self, self-expiring. And it can be revoked by the parent at any time. And there are, so, there are as the slide mentions, there are for, formalities on execution of this document. <clears throat> but you know, where would you use a document like this? It, if you, again, are away from your children for an extended period, if you haven't been to see your children because of, of, of a quarantine or a travel uh, type of uh, delay, if you're forced uh, into some sort of situation <clears throat> due to healthcare issues where, you know, you're not going to be available to make some of these decisions, um, I can think of a handful of cases where, you know, we've had to get these signed for families right when the quarantines were happening because parents were either out of the country or they were traveling or they were stuck and, you know, the governor's order was closing schools. And so certain decisions needed to be made, certain forms needed to be signed. And so these, these documents really uh, were, were helpful in those types of situations. Um, so I think that's what I wanted to cover on this slide. Jeff, if you could go to the next one, please. <clears throat> and this, um, this is just a follow-up on the, the delegation. This is a, a little bit different. I mentioned earlier that there is a formal guardianship process in Michigan. Every state has its own 
procedure and set of rules. And in your estate plan, as Lori mentioned earlier, this is this is an opportunity for you to be in control. And one of the the items that you will uh, you will address in your estate plan is is if you have minor children, who will be the guardian, who will be the designated guardian of that child. And that's typically done in your last will and testament. Um, it's common practice to do that. And uh, I, I think the, the courts, the probate courts, are comfortable following guardianship designations in a will because that's what's seen most of the time. But it's not required. And if you if you don't have the time to properly invest in an estate plan or it's just not something that you're able to get to, what you can do at least in the comfort of your own home is to designate a guardian on a separate piece of paper. It doesn't have to be your last will and testament. And Michigan law allows you to do this. And so as the slide mentions, um, there are uh, rules in place that will allow a, a designated guardian to have priority in the event a, a minor child needs a guardian. And outside of the will, it can be done in the separate document that we mentioned. Uh, it doesn't need to be fancy. It can be typed. Uh, it can be handwritten. Um, the, the formalities of execution are a little bit different than some of the other legal documents. But as, a, as general practice, these are typically uh, witnessed and sometimes notarized. But um, in our state of quarantine and social distancing, it's 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 obviously complicated and, and a bit difficult to have formal um, execution on legal documents right now. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> and Lori's going to talk about um, finances. And just before she gets to that, I I think Lori mentioned earlier the the executive order from Michigan's governor uh, allowing for remote notarization. I, I think um, that came out yesterday, and um, the professional community is analyzing it. Our firm was involved in um, in several committees to help put that together. There were a lot of laboring oars um, and other law firms who were involved in that, and at the state bar level, it was really just a, I think, a wonderful piece of work product that we were fortunate to have uh, finally implemented. And now it, it now we're working on kind of the practical implementation of this. How is the remote notarization going to work? There are a lot of uh, rules associated with it for it to be valid. And um, as Lori mentioned, we're going to be issuing an alert on, on this um, shortly. But in the meantime, I think we wanted to get the point across that in, in this period of time while we are, you know, quarantined and um, there's only necessary travel allowed, there, we are going to be seeing more remote types of execution of documents. And so um, I, I think it's an important advancement, especially for the time we're experiencing right now. And it, I, I think the takeaway is legal documents estate plan documents, other types of documents that, that you really, you know, should uh, have signed. They don't need to be put off. Um, if, if it's really important, I think there are ways to get it done. And this remote notarization and witnessing, I think, is is going to help with that. Um, Lori, um, please, I'll pass it over to you uh, to start talking about some of the financial aspects and the power of attorney. <clears throat> So when we think about what if I'm unable for whatever reason to take care of things for myself, we think about those day-to-day -day financial management kinds of things. And again, this can come up in two situations. One is if you are incapacitated and unable to manage things for yourself. But the other is if you're working 20 hours a day as an essential worker and somebody just needs to keep your life afloat. So joint owners of bank accounts can access the entire account because a joint owner of a bank account owns the account just as much as you do. So if you have a joint bank account, each joint owner has full access to the whole account. So for married couples, typically that is how people own their bank accounts and then both spouses can handle the account. Other people sometimes will add a child or another trusted family member to their bank account. 
there are pros and cons of that because as I said, a joint owner of a bank account is an owner just as much as you are. So that is one way that people provide for management of their financial affairs if they're unable to do so or unavailable. Things like IRAs, annuities, life insurance, those sorts of things can't generally be jointly owned. And so you can't have a joint owner. And so it can be difficult to deal with those assets if you're unavailable or unable, unless you have some formal person delegated to handle those things. Next slide. We recommend a durable power of attorney. So a durable power of attorney is a written document. It remains effective even if you are incapacitated. And it's a good way of avoiding probate court conservatorship or other court intervention in your financial affairs. You can fine tune the power of attorney to limit those things that somebody has a, the ability to take care of for you. You can have multiple powers of attorney. So you might, if you're a small business owner, you might have a power of attorney specifically for business matters and a separate power of attorney that designates a family member to handle more personal matters. You can make it effective immediately or only with proof of incapacity. So generally, we recommend that the power of attorney be effective immediately. That way, if there's an issue where you're not incapacitated, but you are unavailable, then your durable power of attorney can be used to take care of things on your behalf. The document has to be either witnessed or notarized. If you're going to use it for a real estate transaction, it has to be notarized. Under the new uh, executive order, you can do that remotely. So if you have something that is coming up that needs to be handled, that durable power of attorney is a great way to take care of those financial matters that you can't take care of on your own behalf, either because you're unavailable, you're overwhelmed, or you're incapacitated. Go ahead and switch to the next slide. So what can you do now? So it's a good idea to sign or update a durable power of attorney. And again, even if you think, well, I don't have any assets, I have a power of attorney for my son so that I can deal with his landlord in his off-campus apartment because I would rather do that than have him make a separate deal. Um, so the power of attorney isn't only if you have a lot of money, it can allow somebody to handle your day-to-day -day financial matters, even things like fighting with your cell phone carrier, fighting with your um, internet provider, all those kinds of things, those day-to-day -day financial matters. It's obviously important that you appoint somebody that you trust. Whoever you appoint is accountable to you and accountable to your family. With the durable power of attorney, you are still in charge. And so unless you are incapacitated, your decisions still trump the decisions of a person acting under your power of attorney. That power is not taken away from you. You can change and revoke that durable power of attorney at any time. But that is something we recommend that you think about doing now. Raj, do you want to handle the next couple of slides for us? Sure, Lori. Thank you. So this slide is, is just getting into a, a slightly different topic, and I want to cover a few tax issues and relief that we're seeing in light of the COVID pandemic. And th there's a lot to, to, to really extract from all of the laws that have been passed recently. Uh, some of you are familiar with the CARES Act, which was the you know, several trillion dollar stimulus pack package passed into law. And there, there are other related pieces of legislation. Um, governors across the country are issuing executive orders left and right <clears throat> on certain rules and requirements and guidance. And the Internal Revenue Service is uh, similarly giving notices and guidance to taxpayers on certain events that happen in the life cycle of a taxpayer. And so just a few that I want to cover here, because it's, I think it's geared towards the discussion we're having on your personal planning and I think what 
you know, viewers have asked us to cover in this presentation. Um, the first thing I want to mention is, you know, in addition to having your house in order and doing a checkup on your estate plan, also be aware of, you know, your tax situation. And you should be in touch with your tax preparer CPA. We, we all know the April 15 deadline coming up to file our <clears throat> individual tax returns for 2019, but hopefully many of you um, are now apprised of the extension, the automatic extension of that April 15 deadline. This was part of the temporary relief provided by the Internal Revenue Service. And what that covered in the form of a notice was an extension, an automatic extension on the April 15 tax payment deadline. Initially, it only covered tax payment, but not the, the actual return. Then there was a, a subsequent notice that covered the return. So now, you know, taxpayers could rely on um, both notices and not, uh, not have to worry about filing tax returns here next week. And also first quarter estimates. So for those of you who are owners and businesses or self-employed and are making quarterly tax payments, uh, first Q, uh, which is due uh, typically April 15, is is now extended as well. And the extension date, for those of you that don't have it, is July 15. That's an automatic extension. It doesn't cover all types of tax and returns, but um, for individuals, it does. And, you know, the saying three times the charm, I think that that's kind of what we've been seeing with the service. They've issued a handful of notices, but um, the third issue, the third notice that was released on this, it was just a few days ago, also extended second quarter estimates. So, you know, the, the logic behind it was first quarter was extended automatically to July 15, but second quarter was still due June 15. So there was a little bit of a disconnect. And I think after several groups, um, legal and tax groups, and Lori and I are part of a few of those, we've been writing letters and providing analysis to Treasury, trying to uh, allow them to consider other types of relief that makes sense. And so I think this third notice we received a few days ago um, was helpful because it tied everything together. So now second quarter estimates are are, are pushed off to July 15 as well. Um, all of us are in different situations. There are many different types of tax, many different types of returns, just focusing right now on the individual returns. And state income taxes is, is a different issue. Um, the IRS governs federal the administration of federal income tax, the state of Michigan Treasury Department governs state income tax. And so um, we we received anticipated guidance from our governor, I think a few weeks ago, uh, or it might have been as soon as last week, that also uh, extended Michigan state filings to be consistent with um, federal. So that was welcome news. So something you should be aware of. And, and also should be discussing with your tax preparer. Um, just just as a bullet on this slide, other states may apply. What I mean by that is um, you, you might not just be paying income tax or have tax responsibility in the state of Michigan. If you're employed in, in another state or if you receive uh, what's called a K-1 showing income from different sources, from different uh, entities, you might be receiving them from other states and so you might have income tax obligations in other states just a good time to check in with your preparer and, and see what types of relief other states that govern uh, your situation have have announced <clears throat> um, another item on this slide I want to talk about are, are the rebate stimulus checks I, I think that's pretty well known now that was part of the cares act uh, package and it, it, again, it was one of the handful of individual relief provisions in that stimulus bill, and, and it essentially allows for um, uh, a rebate in the form of a tax credit to taxpayers. So there's different amounts uh, that apply depending on your tax 
filing status, whether you're single, married, filing separately, married, filing jointly, there's there's an amount that will apply to you. And uh, like most relief provisions or credits under the tax code, there are phase outs. So the, the, the tax rules are going to look at your what's called your adjusted gross income, and, and that's going to determine whether you still qualify for this rebate. And at, at some threshold, um, it, you know, I'll tell you it's close to the $200,000 mark. That's when you're, you know, essentially completely phased out of this rebate. So I, I think it's welcome news. It applies to many taxpayers. It doesn't apply to all. And all the more reason to, you know, as you're going through this process, you're getting your house in order. Even though tax filing deadlines are extended, still a good time to check in with your advisor team, your tax preparer, to see if this rebate applies to you. And there is some strategy involved with it because the, the service is going to look at your last filed tax return. So, you know, there might be an opportunity to look at 2018 if 2019 hasn't been filed. Um, another takeaway are low interest rates. So again, I think the, the theme of this presentation is what can you be doing with, with not a lot of professional assistance right now? What can you be doing while you're at home, while you're trying to look at things before you, you know, start contacting your your professionals and, and, and attorneys for advice? And one of the things to consider is our low interest rate environment. Um, the Fed has slashed rates significantly and then that impacts a lot of uh, commerce and how we do business from commercial loans to uh, third party and private family loans. And, and what, we're, what we're seeing right now are um, probably unprecedented, uh, unprecedentedly low interest rates. So for April, um, uh, the interest rate that applies if, if you're making loans to family members, for example, it uses a specific type of rate to use instead of in, in lieu of creating income tax or transfer tax consequences called the applicable federal rate. And the takeaway here is that AFR rate is less than 1% in some cases, depending on the length of the loan. And so in this uh, time of need, in this time where we want to help others, if you're looking at helping family members, if you're in need of money and want to borrow, um, aside from third parties or commercial lenders, you know, family members can help and family members will typically want to apply uh, an AFR type of rate and with rates less than 1% in some cases, that can be, I think, uh, a wonderful opportunity not only to help, but, um, you know, to to reduce the, you know, income tax consequence of, of those types of family loans. And I also mentioned uh, state planning and refi opportunities. I mean, these types of loans are done in more advanced estate planning, not the focus of this presentation, but they, they can be helpful in some context. And then refi opportunities, I think we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, mortgage lenders and commercial financing professionals just overwhelmed right now because of, you know, the low interest rates. I think the 30-year fixed um, is is at an all-time low. I don't know what today's quote is, but when I checked last week, it was somewhere around three, three point eight something around there. But you know, you were seeing a lot of opportunities to refi and and capture some of these low interest rates. And this is real, this is real dollars, real savings. Depending on how much of an interest rate is you are saving by doing a refi. I mean, this is dollars in your pocket to help you in a time of need. So. There are many other opportunities here, but these are just some of the, the tax-related uh, types of issues. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Lori just to, to close out our presentation. We are we are at nine o'clock, but you know we we've been getting some questions both during the presentation and and also beforehand um, about different scenarios. And, and I think you know I'll let Lori kind of finish up on this, but this is really geared to be a um, really i think just a general how can how can we help what can you do um right now uh in in light of what we're going through and there are many different types of uh planning techniques out there i think there are um 
things that can be done beyond just the basics that we haven't covered and and we really didn't intend to cover that today so um, I think all the more reason that if if this presentation has has allowed you to kind of think through situations in your um, you know your own personal planning you know it, it would be a good idea to then reach out to your own advisor to see how he or she can help and and maybe uh, probably anal analyze your specific fact situation um, so Lori I think I think this is probably a good time to to shift to you and 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 maybe you can you know conclude for us today. <clears throat> Thanks Raj. So we appreciate your listening to us this morning and sharing your very valuable time with us. We're all in this together and we're seeing a lot of information. Our recommendation is do what you can when you can. Don't try to do everything perfectly. We can cobble things together and we can clean things up when this mess is over. So give yourself some slack, give everybody else some slack. Your professional advisors, including everybody at Miller Johnson are here to help you and we will do our very best to do that. One thing I did wanna bring up is if you are a first responder, an essential worker, uh, the State Bar of Michigan has just yesterday published um, a request for lawyers to step in and provide some free basic estate planning for people who are in those roles. So if you are in that position and uh, or if you know someone in that position, we can send you to the link to that information. So thank you so much for being here. We will answer your questions directly those will post and if you want them to be private just let us know and we'll respond privately up on your screen you will see raj's contact information and my contact information feel free to reach out to us and again all of your advisors are here to help you and we wish you a safe and healthy uh, universe and that we will all get through this together so thank you for being with us today